Pokemon Crystal version released in 2001 for the Game Boy Color as the final main series Pokemon game on the console. By 2001, Pokemania as we knew it started to die out, however if we take a look at this official Nintendo Power Strategy Guide for Pokemon Crystal, where we can get the clues that we can use, we still have the old school Pokemon charm with that classic Ken Sugimori artwork. Pokemon artwork has been pretty much the same ever since the Ruby and Sapphire era, and starting with the Ruby and Sapphire fire strategy guides, they began to be more polished and really haven't changed all too much compared to the modern guides, but these old guides are like the Wild West. If you're new here, one thing we like to do around here is take a look at these strategy guides, talk about what weird or interesting things they say about each game in them, then use these guides to beat the game while ignoring any prior knowledge I have on that game. We've had some hilarious results in the past, and trust me, you won't want to miss this one on Pokemon on Crystal. So taking a closer look at the guide, the cover just has the title of the game and a picture of Suicune, then on the back it says, don't train in vain. The Pokemon Crystal version player's guide is the one item no trainer can be without. Let the pros from Nintendo Power guide you through the Pokemon Crystal with detailed maps of every area and a Pokedex with 251 creatures plus information on the unknown, the move tutor, and other items and moves exclusive to the newest member of the colorful Pokemon series. On the first page of the guide, it shows the staff list of Nintendo Power Pros who helped write this guide, including Jumping Jack Yushi. They're the only ones with a verb before their name, so they must be a Nintendo Pro. The following pages show a map of Johto and Kanto, and perhaps in a future video we can do the Kanto post game, but for this video we're only doing the main game in Johto, followed by an introduction to all of the key characters in the game. It's all coming in crystal clear. Each of these screenshots for the support characters show them in some way, shape, or form with your mom calling you or showing Elm standing in his lab. Then for Bill, there's just some text that says, what? The next few pages explain the basics, say what the Pokedex is, how to use a Pokemon Center, shows the new abilities, or rather attacks since these pre-generation 3 guides sometimes call attacks abilities, how to catch Pokemon, and it talks about Pokemon eggs. On page 9 it says, Pokemon Egg. Pokemon researchers have uncovered exciting news about Pokemon reproduction. Pokemon eggs have been discovered in the wild, and it's starting to look like the unhatched creatures are produced by interactions between Pokemon, which makes it seem like they just discovered that Pokemon lay eggs and reproduce after all of this time, and they're just finding it out. I, I don't understand what Pokemon researchers are doing if they didn't know that Pokemon laid eggs until now. There's a few more pages covering more of the basics, which do go more in depth than some other guides we've looked at, including a sample team that has Mareep, a Pokemon that it later says you can't even catch in Crystal version, so I don't know how they expect you to get one, and that when catching Pokemon, we can bring them home by incapacitating them. It then explains eggs a bit more in breeding, as well as some Pokemon that can't breed together or even breed at all. I still don't understand why Nidorino and Nidorina can't breed, but I'm sure some condescending commenter will explain it to me. Then it shows some Pokemon that are always female and some Pokemon that are always male, then Pokemon that are neuter, or Pokemon that don't have a gender, like Ditto. As for the back section of the guide, here we have some information on the post game and battle tower, a Pokedex, the berry section, of course, and even where to find every Pokemon, which is very useful. With all that out of the way, let's load up a brand new save on Pokemon Crystal and hammer away at it to beat it exactly how Nintendo intended. This then starts the walkthrough section of the guide where we begin in New Barktown. It may be small, but it's packed with places. Those places are our house, the professor's lab, and that's about it. The guide doesn't detail the differences between each starter Pokemon and just says to choose wisely, so I just picked Chikorita since it had it under the sample team earlier, so it must be the best. Later on in Cherry Grove City, we take on the tour of the town, learn about the Poke Mart, and head north and learn about berries, which is very good. We eventually make it to Mr. Pokemon's house and meet Professor Oak, and when we leave, Professor Elm calls us in a panic. 
We have to rush back to his lab, but on the way we run into this weird red-haired boy who is apparently our rival. The guide says his Pokemon are only level 5, and as long as we've had a few wild Pokemon battles, we should be fine, and we were fine. The boy says his name is question mark, question mark, question mark, so naturally when I'm asked what his name was from the police officer at the lab, I just respond by naming him question mark, question mark, question mark. After that's done, we can focus on our own journey for a bit by heading across Route 30, meeting the infamous youngster Joey, and catch a Bellsprout for a future trade the guy suggests we do coming up soon, as well as a Pidgey because birds are neat. In Violet City, we can study hard at Earl's Pokemon Academy and trade our Bellsprout for an Onyx named Rocky. Next, we clear out the Sprout Tower, and one random change that the tower has in Crystal over Gold and Silver is that instead of finding an X Defend on the second floor, it's actually an X Accuracy now. The tower itself wasn't too bad thanks to our recently acquired bird, though. We can now set our sights on the Violet City Gym, and the guide says this gym won't be a problem if you picked up the Onyx in the trade. The guide does detail what Pokemon the Gym Leader has, as well as the their levels and types, and it seems to only do so for the gym leaders and the rival fights. Some guides do this for every single trainer in the game, and some barely even detail the teams at all. We're able to defeat Faulkner with Onyx and a little help from Pidgey, but Onyx is a bit high level now, so it stopped obeying us. The next page then shows the ruins of the Alf, although we can't fully explore it yet, so I just continue through the Union Cave where you can apparently find a special Lapras on Fridays. I had no idea about this. Once in Azalea Town, this NPC tells us that Slowpoke Tails are tasty, aren't you glad I told you that? And no, I'm not glad I heard that. The first thing we can do here is visit Kurt, then assist him in the Slowpoke well where Team Rocket is hiding. The guy didn't really say too much about Team Rocket, but I did catch a Slowpoke myself because everyone here says they're such a big deal, so I wanted them. With Team Rocket cleared out the well, we can now take on the Azalea Town Gym, where the guide suggests Fire-type moves and Flying-type moves. The first line the guide has for Bugsy's Gym is, Bugsy likes Bug-type Pokemon, which makes your job easier, just roasting Bug-types for no reason. And if we didn't have a Pidgey on our team, this might have been difficult, but instead Pidgey lays waste to Bugsy's intrepid team to allow us to collect the Hive Badge. Our bird then evolves into Pidgeotto after this gym too, which is rather fitting. Before leaving town, we have another rival fight against none other than question mark, question mark, question mark. The guide again recommends electric types, although they are very sparse in Crystal version, especially this early on. Our Pokemon are level 16 though and are completely healthy as the guide suggested, so we outlast our rival for the victory. For the dark, gloomy Elex Forest, we rescue Farfetch'd, get the Headbutt TM, and make it to Route 34, not to be confused with anything else that has 34 in it. The guide suggests we give some trainers here our phone number for some various items it can give us later on, like a Leaf Stone. Our Chikorita then evolves into Bayleaf. Then when we reach the daycare center, we're given an egg. They don't give you this egg in gold and silver, so getting a second egg this early on is pretty nice. Our Togepi hatches around this time, which is pretty fitting timing, but I decide to put it in the box in favor of our new egg, and some other Pokemon that we'll obtain shortly. For Goldenrod City, there's a ton to do, and we'll be returning here later on. Team Rocket can be found skulking around the city. First, we visit the radio tower to get our radio card, get a bike from the bike shop, and check out the department store. Here, there is a trade involving an Abra for a Machomp, and later on in the guide, it recommends fighting type Pokemon for Whitney's upcoming gym. I check the guide and see where we get an Abra, and notice that we can get one in the game corner for just 100 coins, which is pretty cheap. I collect some coins, exchange them for an Abra, then trade it for a chop named Muscles. I then train it up in the Goldenrod Underground, which has some daily events, then head into the Goldenrod City Gym, headlined by Whitney and her normal type foes. Every trainer in Goldenrod City's gym is female, which is interesting, but doesn't change anything. Trainers are trainers. Machop makes quick work of the junior trainers, and I also switch train Slowpoke during these fights to level it up a bit more. For the fight against Whitney, she only has two Pokemon, but they're powerful normal type Pokemon. We use fighting type moves from Muscles the Machop as suggested and defeat Whitney in two shakes of a lamb's tail, although Muscles narrowly hangs on with only one HP to end the battle. With our third gym badge in hand, we have a few more tasks in Goldenrod to take care of, like some tree relief to wake up the Sudowoodo up north and see Kanpo in the underground who sells medicine at low prices, but they're bitter and your Pokemon won't like them much. Maybe potions aren't a very good bargain. You can do better. 
I'm not really sure what that means, but up north we have the bug catching contest since it was Tuesday when I was playing at this point. The guide shows us all the Pokemon we can catch in the bug catching contest here and the prizes, however the best thing I was able to get was a Caterpie since I whited out against a pincer trying to catch it. We don't get any of the top 3 place prizes, but at least we get a berry as a consolation prize. As we continue across, we use our squirt bottle on this weird tree, collect rock smash, and make it to Ecritique City. This is where we meet Bill, who can give us an Eevee if we go see him back in Goldenrod City, defeat the Kimono Girls for the Surf HM, then visit the Burn Tower. Here we meet Yusin as well as Morty, the local gym leader who specializes in ghost type Pokemon, and run into our rival again who bulked up his Pokemon roster. After defeating question mark question mark question mark, we see some funny looking dogs and can even find two of them roaming around if we're lucky. I did manage to run to Raikou shortly after this, but only had great balls and couldn't catch it. The other egg we got then hatched into a Magby, which is pretty cool since we don't have a fire type Pokemon yet, but won't be too useful against Morty's ghost type gym. Morty's Pokemon are weak to Psychic and Ground attacks, which makes our Pokemon selection process pretty easy. I use the Slowpoke we've been training up a bit, which really shines here since it has Confusion now, although I did lose on the first attempt to Morty because Curse was really annoying, so I had to train it up a bit before trying for a second time. Second time's the charm, I think that's how that saying goes, as we scare off Morty's ghouls for our fourth gym badge. The next page shows the Tin Tower, which we don't have full access to yet, so instead we go to Routes 38 and 39, where the guide says there's trainers here using flying, electric, grass, and water-type Pokemon, among others. I don't know why they didn't just say various types, but here we can melt tank Milady. Then last but not least, we can give our number to this last here for a potential Thunderstone later on. Once in the port town of Olivine City, we fish for items including a good rod and the strength HM, then check out the nearby lighthouse. The guide suggests electric type Pokemon for the lighthouse, so I catch a Magnemite and make our way to the top. Here we see Jasmine with a sick Ampharos, who tells us to go to Signwood City to get medicine for the Ampharos. The sick Ampharos is just one problem the lighthouse is facing since there's a bunch of dangerous holes in the floor that anybody could just fall down. We surf on over to Cyanwood City and once we get there we can get some meds from the 500 year old pharmacy. I still don't understand how they have had Pokemon medicine for at least 500 years but just recently learned that Pokemon lay eggs. Steal a shuckle then prepare to fight Chuck's fighting type gym. He only has two Pokemon and we have all four of the recommended types at the guide lists. So even though we were a little bit under leveled, we were able to take him out with no real issues. This also allows us to get the Fly HM so we can make it back to Olivine City quicker by flying on our Pidgeotto, deliver the medicine to the Ampharos, and then fight Jasmine's Steel type gym. Jasmine prefers Steel type Pokemon which are powerful against Grass, Ice, Flying, Psychic, Bug, Rock, Ghost, Dragon, Dark, and Steel Pokemon according to the guy. That's like half the types. Machop is able to take care of her lead Magnemite while Slowpoke handles her Steelix, then her final Magnemite was handled by shuffling in some of our other party members. After winning, we get the Mineral Badge as our sixth gym badge and already are in the home stretch of this game since the last couple of gyms really snowball into each other rather quickly, and it's also fitting that the next gym is an ice type gym. Onwards to the Township of Mahogany now by way of Route 42. You will run into a number of oddities and roadblocks when you first enter Mahogany Town. First, we have the messed up mart where something isn't quite right. They're selling bizarre items including Slowpoke Tail. Could this be related to what happened at the Slowpoke well? Before we investigate that further, we need to go north to Route 43 and avoid paying the toll by going the long way around to the Lake of Rage. Here we have Wesley of Wednesday, and since it was Wednesday when I played this game, we're able to see him and get a black belt for our Machoke. After that, we can go and try to catch the Red Gyarados, and the guide does say to save our game, but the Red Gyarados ended up knocking itself out from confusion right as I was trying to catch it. Since I like the team we have now, I didn't care too much about missing it, and the guide also said it's okay if you don't catch it, so I figured it's fine. When we return to the land, we meet Lance, who asks us for our help to take a closer look at the sketchy mart in Mahogany Town. We storm in, and surprise, it's a Team Rocket hideout. We battle our way through as Muscles evolves, reach the PC in the center to turn off the surveillance, get the two passwords we need to enter the final room, and have a couple of key Team Rocket battles, but the guide doesn't outline their Pokemon or anything. With Team Rocket cleared out now, we can take on Price and his Ice-type gym. 
Price prefers Pokemon of the chili variety, including Piloswine and Ice and Ground type. You will deal with the Ice type attack favoring Pokemon differently. Use a Tough Water type on Piloswine, so we can use Slowpoke. Pick a Fire type to battle with Dugong, which we don't have one unfortunately, and an Electric type to duke it out with Seal. Magnemite evolves into Magneton against one of the junior trainers here, and our new Magneton really shines here, shocking price for our 7th gym badge. After we've defeated 7 gym leaders, Team Rocket will take over the radio tower in Goldenrod City. There's lots of Team Rocket members in the tower, watch it. The guy then tells us about a special evening broadcast in the radio tower, but they're currently in the middle of being held hostage by Team Rocket, so I don't think that broadcast is going out tonight. We make it through the tower, to the imposter director, and then we go underground and get the key from the real director, then attention shoppers, we appear under the department store. I then go back to the radio tower and dispatch the rest of Team Rocket for one last time, and then pick up the Eevee from Bill before leaving, but just leave it in the PC since we don't really need it right now. I thought it would be cool to evolve it into Flareon to have a fire type, since the guide recommended fire type a couple of times. But getting stones is a bit complicated in this game because you just have to hope that one of the random trainers calls you and gives you one and I haven't gotten one yet. Next we go to Route 44, we can do very well against all comers if we bring along an electric and water type. I've been trying my best to follow these types that the guide recommends as much as possible, which is why while we were slipping and sliding in the ice path, I picked up a tough ice type in Swinub that I named Nugget since the guide recommended a strong ice type for Claire's Dragon type gym. There really isn't all that much to do in Blackthorn City besides fight Claire's gym, so I spent some time getting to about level 40 or so as the guide suggested. This is the only fight that they don't recommend specific types for. They do recommend a strong ice type in the paragraph about Claire, but there is no little section under Claire like every other gym leader has showing specific types. But while grinding, Swinub evolved into Piloswine. After grinding, we head into Claire's gym, where Piloswine really shines to give us our last gym badge. We'll have to visit the Dragon's Den first and talk to the Elder, then we get the Rising Badge. Fangtastic. Now we can fly back to New Bark Town and surf on over to the Cantor region to head through the Victory Road and then the Elite Four. The guide has a full map to follow through the Victory Road and at the very end we have Rival Battle number 5. It says that Dark types are ideal but if we don't have one to focus on Electric and Psychic types, so we use Magneton and Slowbro to lay waste to question mark question mark question mark's team in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Now versus the Elite Four. The Elite Four battle is misleading, you actually have to fight 5 excellent trainers with very strong Pokemon. You can't stop at the Pokemon Center between battles, so you'd better bring some HP restoring products, revives, and other important items with you. I stock up some items and grind the team out to be around level 50 with our team being Slowbro, Meganium, Pidgeot, Magneton, Machoke, and Piloswine. We have most of what the guide suggests for all of the Elite Four members, like a powerful Electric type and a strong Ice type, but we don't have a Fire type still since I never used the Magmi that we hatched, and never got a Fire Stone for Eevee, and outside of that there's really not that many Fire types we could have captured. First up is Will and his pesky Psychic type Pokemon. This trainer's teams are all dual types that include Psychic type. If you attack each Pokemon's other type's weaknesses, you should have no problems. For example, attack Zatu with an Electric type, because Flying types are weak against them. A very powerful Psychic or Dark type Pokemon, level 55 or higher, could be used to combat the entire team on its Psychic type. We do exactly that and emerge victorious. For the fight against Koga, the guide says Koga uses Bug types and Poison types, and with his first move he'll try to poison your Pokemon. He'll also try to confuse your Pokemon, leaving them somewhat helpless. Take him out as quickly as you can with your Psychic type and Fire type. The longer the battle goes on, the less likely it is that you'll emerge victorious. Slowbro is just really, really strong and covers most of what the guide recommends to defeat Koga pretty easily. Unlike Koga, Bruno won't try to mess with your Pokemon status. Instead, he will use Pokemon that strike hard and strike fast and hopefully show no mercy, hoping to knock your team out quickly and painfully. If you have a fast Psychic type, use it to put the hurt on most of Bruno's team. Use a Water type on Onix, the only non-fighting type on Bruno's team. And again, Slowbro is really strong here. It isn't exactly a fast Psychic type, but at least it is a Psychic type. For Karen, we have all the recommended types for her battle, and the guide says Karen, the last Elite Four member, uses Dark type Pokemon in battle. 
Her Pokemon are particularly weak against fighting types, but water types and electric types also work against her dual type dark Pokemon. Karen's other Pokemon share the poison type which will be easily dispatched with psychic or ground type. In hindsight, fighting types really aren't particularly great against Karen because she has a ghost type in Gengar and a vile plume that's part poison type, but we do still get through her without even taking very much damage. All that leaves now is the champion, Lance. It recommends electric and ice types for this battle, and the paragraph says, Yes, it's the same Lance from the Lake of Rage. He's grateful for your help, but he's also the champion, so you have to beat his team of mostly dragon types. His team is united in flying types, so an electric type will deal damage to every member of the team. Dragon types are weak against ice types, so a powerful ice type Pokemon should also be in your party. Piloswine, the powerful ice type, really carries us in that fight as we defeat Lance, meaning we beat Pokemon Crystal how Nintendo intended, at least according to this official Nintendo Power Guide written over 20 years ago. Pokemon Crystal is one of my least played Pokemon games as when I want to play through a Generation 2 game I typically just play Gold and Silver or even Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Although it is basically identical to Gold and Silver with small differences that are noticeable here and there. As for the guide, the intro and the back section of the guides are some of the best I've ever seen in a Pokemon guide, while the actual walkthrough portion was rather bare bones. That's not really a bad thing as it was still easy to follow, but the whole walkthrough only spanned about 35 pages while some other guides we've looked at are over 100 pages for the walkthrough alone. There really weren't that many mistakes that I noticed. Some of the type recommendations, especially against the Elite Four, were a bit weird. And it did do a good job at guiding you through the game, with the exception of the Mareep mishap at the start since you can't even catch Mareep and Crystal. Seeing how much fire types were recommended in this game though, and grass types just weren't recommended like at all, I think Cyndaquil would have been the more optimal starter since the only type I ever missed from the recommendations was fire type. For the rest of the guide, it does detail Kanto and how to catch Suicune and some other legendary Pokemon, so if you guys want to see a part 2 on Pokemon Crystal, let me know in the comments down below, and if we pass, say, 5,000 likes by the end of the month, I'll do it. With Scarlet and Violet right around the corner, I hope to do an intended video like this on those games, even if it has to be on some sort of bootleg guide like we had to do with Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. And with all that out of the way, thank you so much for watching, have a great rest of your day, and bye bye.